Hi, everybody. This is Tobin Arthur, the CEO of AngelMD, and I am joined by my good friend, John Friedman, who is typically based in New York, is in Connecticut at present during the COVID-19 crisis. John has a storied career in the venture capital world, having led Easton Capital as one of the most successful venture firms in the space. John's an attorney by training, has got just an incredible background and wealth of knowledge. So we're very fortunate to spend a few minutes with John today to share insights with those of you who are raising capital as startups. John, welcome. Thank you, Tobin. It's good to see you. And I hope you and everyone who's listening to this stays safe. And you know, follows basically intuition and common sense, no matter what government says. Uh, follow your own intuition and common sense. As they say, John, common sense is not all that common anymore. Correct, unfortunately. <laughs> um, for another day, we could discuss John's art collection, which is pretty incredible. But today, we'll stay focused on just a few basic um, things. And I, I thought we'd start off, John, by just having you share uh, companies that you recollect, recollect over time that have stood out uh, for various reasons and, and why uh, they've stood out. All right. Uh, you know, the, the critical, comp there were three or four critical components uh, in making a company successful. One through three is management. Uh, you know, you, in five minutes after you've been, I've been doing this 41 years, or this is my 41st year, uh, so which makes me either a sadomasochist or a slow learner. That said is what you quickly learn in five minutes if you are not totally sold on a management team, that they will deal with the surprises, most of which are negative, which occur as they're launching their new company, uh, then they're likely not to succeed or certainly not to optimize returns. So the first thing we look at is management team. Second is basically the size of the market, because even if you have a great product, if the market's not large enough, you know, no one wants the, the, a jumbo shrimp, as it were. We're looking for much bigger uh, companies. So the second thing is market. Third thing is what do you have and is it unique? The, is it really paradigm shifting? And that's especially true in this environment and this climate. Uh, we don't know what will happen at the end of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but one thing is clear. If you invest in something or you start something that deals with a paradigm shifting a product, i.e. something that cures an uncurable disease, treats an untreatable condition, dramatically improves treatment, or extends life measured in years, not months, or lowers the gold standard of the cost of the gold standard of healthcare, uh, that there will always be a market for that. Because as we all know in today's environment, especially uh, the first and last dollar that anyone will spend is on healthcare. And hopefully none of you don't, uh, none of you know people who are seriously ill, but if you do, it becomes even more clear on a personal level that paradigm holds true. And so that's the critical thing. So just talking about, you know, in my 40, 41 years of doing this, some companies that have stood out, and I'm going to focus on not just on companies that have already, because it's easy in hindsight to say, oh, that was a unicorn, so it had to be a great company. Uh, talk about some unicorns, but in addition, some other things that may not yet have demonstrated their unicorn status. So first one, chronologically, is U.S. healthcare. Uh, during my basically decade at Warburg Pincus, I was on the U.S. healthcare. This is one of the first non-bricks and mortar uh, HMOs, PPOs. And you know, at that time, it was just the beginning of the HMO era. We found a great manager, uh, Leonard Abramson, or he found us, and clear that at that, if you look at in the distance a mountaintop and use a military analogy, you know he's going to take that mountaintop and hilltop. He couldn't do an exact attack on the front or a side attack based on you know his best guess he would find another way to take it, and he did. And since it was one of the first non-bricks and mortar, and there was a lot of reason for it, it had fewer fixed costs, et cetera, et cetera, we had a strong view it was gonna succeed. Now, even though I was a junior member of the team, it was 
I learned a number of important lessons. Management, fun, uh, you know, paradigm shifting, and a big enough market, and competitive advantages, A, and in the future. Our Axel, which was, you know, I went in as an individual in a seed round, and, you know, when I tell you the post money, you'll be shocked, $3.2 million. Made 112 on that personally. Unfortunately, I didn't, I was sort of poor. I didn't put in very much. My first investment was $5,000. Shows in those years, you can make a lot of money on $5,000. And it basically paid for my first apartment that I purchased. Uh, but again, superb management team. And, you know, clearly we saw the CRO or I saw the CRO uh, wave coming and it, it happened. Occasionally they don't happen, but this happened. Third one, Bluebird Bio, we were the co-lead in that. You know, it now has a $5 billion market cap. It got as high as 60 times our investment. Uh, we seconded one of our partners, business officer. So we got what's, I think the term of art is a ship parts and, you know, made even more of a multiple on those. And it was clear, you know, these were cures. It was single gene mutations. So it was easy for any gene therapies that are going to work. It's single gene mutations. So, and we have strong evidence that's going to be one of the early uh, gene therapies that is approved. Um, fourth one was cardiovascular systems Inc. Great team. Uh, though there we helped. Uh, funny story. We the uh, the founding team was scientists and they didn't have operators. So we had identified an operator whom we wanted to get in. He had just finished an assignment, was living out on the West Coast. We were in the Midwest in Minnesota. Uh, so we put him on the board, figuring that we'd bait, you know, we'd sort of bait him, uh, bait and switch. So we put him on the board. We thought he'd be enamored by this, and he eventually was and came over. And Cardiovascular Systems Public has about a billion dollar market cap. We went in at a 40 or $50 million valuation. And what we liked is it was a way to treat um, full arterial disease. Stents don't work in below the knee. But simple reason is if you imagine you don't turn to fracture, it's pretty stable. When if you think the knee with all the contortions you can put your knee through, stents have never been a solution. In, I mean, what, excuse me. What this does is it basically the thin and diamond to clear uh, the garbage uh, that's in your knee. You know, the same sort of plaque that you have that a stent clears out, angioplasty clears out. And, you know, basically here you're using, it's oral atherect, like a sanding machine. And the, that, you know, which never really worked, atherectomies in the cardiovascular system because you dislodge pieces and they'd go up to your brain and cause a stroke and kill you. Here, the downside was, and there were, you didn't have stents as an option, the downside was it would go down to your feet and cause you to have to have the same sort of amputation that 150 people have in the United States, in the United States for God's sakes, every year. And what we found was that we sanded out particles that became 99, 99.97% particles were smaller than red and white blood cells. So they came out of your capillary bed. And we've, we're saving now 70,000 uh, at least amputations a year in the United States. So you can feel good about it. And it's important for good venture capitalists to feel good about it and make quite a bit of money. And the nice thing was I've always prided myself of seeing things round pegs for square holes and thinking outside the box and this was a product that you know angels had invested in and spent a lot of money and so it was fair high so it didn't fit the typical venture capital paradigm for a series a round so i could get any uh, other venture capitalists to follow us so we eventually went to a hedge fund which was just beginning to do some alternative investment venture deals as was as well as Mitsui. And then I did a test. I went back to the same venture capitalist. I said, we have a product FDA approved, just needs this to get to launch commercially. And we have a 50, I think it was 45 to $50 million pre-month. Are you interested? 
They said, of course. And I described the management said, they said, of course. I said, when can we see it? I said, you idiot, you've already seen it. So, you know, you want, for those of you who are entrepreneurs, you want a venture capitalist who, you know, constrained by ridiculous templates. Though the template 90% of the time, you want someone who thinks outside the box. And I'll, and I'll finish short, shortly. Another one was ProMix, spun out of another company called Trellis. Prometeo, we just sold for 400 million up front with another billion potential in the back end. It closed two weeks for uh, the COVID shutdown, uh, which is another important lesson. Take the money when you can and close it quickly. Those who try to get every penny out of it in a situation, there's no money. Many, there are, I've seen there are flocks of black swan unicorns which of the like we've never seen before. And the unicorns may go back to being an endangered species, is my guess. Uh, but take the money and stop worrying about, you know, the getting the highest valuation. If it's a reasonable valuation, take it. I'm not just doing this to myself, sir, because I've been on both sides raising a series of A or B or C rounds for companies where we've been a seed investor. So here you're paying when you take one. But I've never, ever, ever met even a moderate, moderately competent entrepreneur or CEO looked in the mirror after a fundraising, which was bigger than said, darn, I'm sorry I took all that money. Never. Uh, two others. One is Trellis, which has a platform, primarily an infectious disease, which, you know, if we can finally get someone's attention and explain the nuances, that we go after the rarer antibodies in COVID-19. And in eight weeks, we'll, in four weeks, we'll find an antibody. And in eight weeks, we'll be able to harvest it, maximum. It's the sort of antibody which is in the B cell compartment. And, it's the, and we can do against the bull uh, screen simultaneously. So it's against a highly region. One of the things that they're now recognizing is even if we get a vaccine, the antibodies, even if they're fully human, ours are fully human, so there won't be any toxicities. Uh, the the uh, product, I mean, the disease may well mutate around that. And if you can, only if you get one against a highly conserved region, will it make a difference long term? And the final final one is you know, which is sometimes you can be ahead of the curve. TMI, which was eventually sold to Esai, and TMI had found a product which is now uh, products. You know, which are used to help surgeons paint and see in real targets. Real blastoma marma, that it was used as a targeting agent. And this was literally nearly 20 years ago, and no one paid any attention to it. FDA recognized it, but venture capitalists didn't care. Big pharma didn't care. Uh, and now, you know, tumor painting is the flavor of the week, and there are at least half a dozen companies going after it. That's going to be critical. So that's a, you know, what we look for. A few companies that have personified that, excuse me, exemplified that. Sorry, it's, you know, these days I'm not as articulate as I would hope to be. You know, key caveats. Manage, again, target your product to something that is critical. Because as long as there's a society and a functioning society, first and last dollar goes to healthcare, first dollar goes to things on not improving delivery necessarily and reducing the number of times you have to take a dose from three times a day to one time a day or from once a day to once a week. Nice. Don't get me wrong. But is that something that or a patient will say, even if I don't have healthcare insurance anymore? Am I going to spend my money on that? No, they're going to spend their money on a true COVID-19 test. They're going to spend on a COVID-19 treatment. Uh, and those are the critical things. And the, uh, and the other thing that I have to just emphasize is do due diligence on someone who's going to invest in you. You know, it's not valuation. And again, in 40 years, I've never seen an entrepreneur 
be happy. And I've seen a lot of examples where it's the opposite case that they got the best valuation without looking in depth the people because there are always going to be surprises for an early stage company. And you want someone who's A, not going to panic, has been through it many times. C, is going to be not going to look for it as an opportunity to cram you down. And D, is going to be the term. Important. You know, as an entrepreneur, you're going to have to raise a lot more money than you think. I just had someone, you know, he had a cancer diagnostic one point and through the FDA. $3,000 a patient. That alone, always, you know, the question. I'm doing a little diligence just it is one of those pods, but I doubt it. But, you know, I hope so because it's a very good idea and the management team looks interesting. But you need more, much more money. And you're protected as an entrepreneur and the whole entrepreneurial team is by of a good venture capitalist. And even if you have a mediocre venture capitalist, you have to be incented. And so there is a floor of the, uh, the amount of equity below which you cannot go. So even, you know, even if you take a lower valuation than you think now, be that there is that floor. So that, those are my sort of some bullet points of what I would advise you. Those are great, great insights, uh, John. And, and I like the, focus on the creativity because so many groups have a formula and they can't think outside of a formula and i have yeah, found I mean, very few i mean today the definition of a value-added venture capitalist i jokingly say who won't destroy your, your company and fire you <laughs> you know i mean there are times you know i've I, been 41 years that's six um founders go you should know that four of those brought me their next deal. They were just great people, right, wrong position, mm. you know, and, and I always back the people, as I said before. And, you know, when, when they left, I said, here's the reason. And, you know, I, I need to back you in a more position which really fit with, and then they brought, four of them brought it to me. One, we had to unfortunately sue about the settlement because I can't, and the other one returned into a district attorney's office. So, when you uh, when you talk about those characteristics, so management, how can a management team, as they were approaching you over the years, how do they demonstrate that they're the kind of team you want to back? What can they do, whether in their presentations or in their track records, or what are the things you're looking for that they might be able to control? Well, I mean, for forty-one years, I've sort of internalized what's a good but there's a fun agree every raise the red flag you know as as arrogant as i may be at times i don't have all the answers i'm looking for the manager to manage i'm there to help i be a person a resource in which you can bounce ideas against which you can bounce ideas uh, off or off of which you can bounce ideas I'm the guy who's making all the substantive decisions. He's not a great manager. On the other hand, a management team that never agrees with, with me and is hostile and adversarial, you know, doesn't work either. You want someone certain enough to, you know, not always agree with you, but open enough to agree with you and to be driven by facts. Mm. And that, those are the, it's a very thin line to walk but you have to be factually based and yep. fact driven. And it seems to me someone who's flexible enough to respond to that is the sort of person I like and someone who's bitter. And if you don't, let's say you're a young scientist, surround yourselves with these people just who have a pharma or, or big med tech, maybe it's someone who's roll leaves is willing to jump in and has you know, demonstrated that ability. So those are the facts that with my advice I would give. What about when, uh, when it comes down to entrepreneurs presenting to you, um, you know, in a pitch session, are there specific things that have made certain entrepreneurs stand out or things that you would recommend to them in terms of preparing uh, in their materials or in their presentation that are important to you? 
sort of walk through the way the build it, market size, you know, product, competitive nature of the product today and in the future. Don't just be static. Look at future. Why see I then uh, management team and then what is financial reflection thereof? Um, you know, um, also don't ship me and be prepared if you're talking about yes you should have some data on the size of the market but it's you know triple negative breast cancer it's a big market you know you don't have to tell me if you're from someone you you have to explain why it's how big a market or why it's a big market not the people you want right so you know just don't try it. honest transparent if there are open issues raise them if there's an issue that a good venture, a good venture capitalist, or any good investor will reach. Why don't you highlight it? Say, here's the risk. Here's not the risk, and that's someone I respect. That's great. And and finally, you know, we're in unusual times with COVID. Uh, none of us have had an experience like this in our lifetimes, and and so this creates stress on these companies. Are there things that you would recommend in a time like this? Is there working to stay alive and, and thrive, ultimately, uh, as they look through the balance of this year. I mean, if you were in their shoes, what are the things that you would be suggesting to them? I suspect one of them you just mentioned, which is uh, if capital is available, you take it and make sure you're, you're, you're um, solvent. But what are some other things that might come to mind? All right, capital efficiency. I mean, you know, do you have a model that I or needs and the I mean, you know, a lot, um, a lot of the immune therapy and oncology, you know, is going to cost hundreds of millions. Uh, target something which has a beat out, number one, that has break the nation. Uh, you know, uh, look at the market. There are 1,760, I think is the number that I heard most recently, on call, you know, immune therapy oncology trials going Think about healthcare use you, you would have a great view about your potential today and over years you could see in the rear view today you're right on a um, the treatment oncology even if a you, you find the clinical trial in the you know the endpoint that that works or actually proves itself out and you get and you get approval which are three big ifs you may still only be gold standard for two or three or six months because 1758 other trials or 1759 so be very aware of that when you look at things you know in immune oncology data platforms and i also like things you know there's a need in other things that have a quick readout so that's what I like to focus on. That's good, good. Well, John, as always, you are full of uh, wisdom. I appreciate some of your time today and sharing and, and the entrepreneurs that are gonna get a chance to hear this will benefit greatly. So thanks for taking time in this crazy time and, and you be safe as well as your family. Appreciate uh, all of your support and, and help. My pleasure and right back at you, my friend. Thank you.